Hi. Um, first of all, long time, no see. Uh, really, really, really sorry for that. Um, for those of you who do not know why it has been such a long time since uh, the last Octoprint on Air episode, um, first of all, uh, pretty much right after the last one, I went on a long overdue vacation. And just when I got uh, off from that again, so to speak, after one week of work, I came down with, well, what I now call the Flu of Doom 2017 edition, um, which took me over a month to recover from, and uh, then some more. Um, it, it was really not fun at all, and I certainly do not recommend it. Uh, this this kind of uh, uh, infection to anyone else um, but uh, well um, it took a while to get back on my feet again but at least I am now back on my feet and have been working on Octoprint now again for about a month I uh, was still a bit shaky here and there um, but uh, I, I also finally recovered from this last uh, shakiness so to speak and now um, I consider myself back at full strength, and so I, f I found it uh, was about time to do the next hangout. So let's just hope that uh, this long delay in between episodes doesn't get a repetition. Uh, I certainly do not need a repetition of the reason for that, so um, yeah, so much for that. Um, uh, just like always, I will uh, tell you today about what I have been up to. Well, apart from being sick <laughs> and um, what I'm planning to do uh, next. And then we'll also have a, a yeah, somewhat medium sized um, Q&A segment again. And I also uh, I already got a couple of questions prepared that uh, that you sent in before on Patreon. And um, we, of course, also have, again, a live chat, though. So um, I will make short breaks during the Q&A segment to give you a chance to also ask questions via the chat, which on mobile you should be able to find down there. And if you are watching this from a desktop browser, I think it should be there. And um, you, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep, an, keep an eye on that. I have the chat on my, on my left side here. And... Uh, yeah, we'll try to take a look there. And now I just have to click away a really annoying desktop error message. <laughs> um, all right. Um, so let's get right into it, I guess. Uh, what I have been up to. So I already mentioned what I have been up to that did not uh, have anything to do with Octoprint, but, but, but what prevented me from doing anything on that. So let's skip that again. And uh, you might have noticed that about two or three weeks ago on the on October 26th I think it was I ha don't have it written down here but I think it was somewhere in, in there uh, I released uh, Octoprint 1.3.5 so the next stable release version um, after four release candidates and um, this time the release candidate process was absolutely awesome I got um, feedback from 27 individuals over the whole uh, course of the RC phase and that was so 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 valuable and uh, I can't thank you enough uh, for that uh, those of you who who gave me feedback um, and it helped to iron out a lot of a lot of kinks that were still left so some rather rare conditions that led to uh, more or less serious bugs and uh, yeah we together we, we we found them you reported them to me I then fixed them pushed out a new RC fixing them and then uh, it got confirmed that they were fixed so this was really nice and uh, and uh, yeah I really hope uh, in future our release candidates will also get this much feedback uh, or even more so um, if you want to uh, know how you can help in that matter with uh, how you how you even get access to release candidates and all that. I talked about that, I think, in Octoprint on Air number 12. I'll look it up, though, and, and link it also in the description later on um, so that you can uh, refresh your memory on that. And uh, once the first release candidate for 1.3.6 hits, you then will also be able to maybe help and report back how it works out for you and uh, yeah, what, what, what still might cause issues or something like that. Okay, uh, so that was 135. 
Uh, what I also did over the past uh, months uh, since the last um, Octopus on Air episode was that I also heavily worked on 1.3.6. So um, that release will, uh, will again be the usual mix of improvements and fixes and all that. And um, I thought I would just talk to you about a couple of the, yeah, let's, let's say uh, la uh, uh, larger changes that will go into this uh, release. Um, after I released 1.3.5, um, I got a lot of reports from people who had issues updating to that version, which then turned out to be uh, issues with corrupted Git, Git uh, repositories. So if, I don't know if you know the nitty gritty details of how Octoprint's update process works so far, but uh, up until now, it fully depends on the Git checkout um, that, uh, for example, you have also running on Octopi. And uh, what it basically does is just the same as if you would update manually from Git. So it, it, it goes into the folder, it, it runs a Git pull, um, then it runs a Python setup by install and all that. And um, this is nice and, and works very great. And it's also very flexible because it also allows you to, uh, to switch to something like the maintenance branch or the devil branch and just have it update against, against those branches, uh, so to speak, against the bleeding edge as, as I'm developing it. But the downside is that if something goes wrong with your Git repository, so with the Git repository data inside that folder, and this is a, is a, is a folder that contains a lot of tiny little files, and if one of them gets corrupt, then stuff can very, very quickly go south. And um, a lot of people, even though uh, I keep warning against that, and everyone basically uh, who's running Raspberry Pi keeps warning against it, a lot of people still just yank out the power cord on the Raspberry Pi. And if this uh, happens um, right when any kind of Git operation, something like, uh, yeah, just looking if there is an update, if anything like this uh, happens in the background, then chances are high that the repository will get corrupted. And then the next time you're trying to update, stuff will not work. So to circumvent this, and also because it will uh, make some other things possible in the future, uh, I decided to finally, um, yeah, turn my back on Git, so to speak, at least for the update process. So the the, I, the change that will be in 136 is that uh, it will no longer rely on the current Git check, uh, the, the local Git checkout to update Octoprint, but instead it will just fetch the archive tarball or, or zip file from, from GitHub. So the full source code dump for that specific version and install that. And that takes one bit out of the whole update process that can and sadly in the past has gone wrong and uh, will hopefully lead to less issues um, for people. Yeah. Um, another problem during the 135 uh, rollout or rather uh, roughly a week after that rollout, I think 10 days or something like that later, uh, which arose and which was n completely outside of my control was that um, the Python package index, which uh, Octoprint and any Python uh, program basically relies on for its dependencies, so libraries that it needs to do one thing or the other, um, th that they changed something on that. So that caused issues with very, very old Octopi installs that were still using some tooling on it that um, yeah, that basically was incompatible to that change. And that also caused some issues in the field. And you might have <laughs> seen the, the urgent, uh, important uh, announcement that I pushed out about this, I think about a week ago. Um, and I hope this resolved things for people out there uh, who were experiencing this. Uh, the problem with changes like that is that there's nothing that I can do to prevent things from that uh, from happening. Um, the thing is that um, yeah, well, basically Octoprint is relies on, 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 on some pieces of infrastructure that simply need to need to work. And um, if something as central as the Python package index changes things and um, you are running a somewhat old Octopi version that still has tooling that is incompatible to that new change, uh, there's nothing I can do from Octoprint side to prevent that. There's also not much that can be done from Octopi's side to prevent that apart from updating it regularly. Um, what I did to yeah, somewhat combat that in the future is that I finally added an FAQ entry about something that a lot of people keep asking, which is 
how do I back up my Octoprint settings and, and all that stuff if I want to reflash a new image. So this is also now in the FAQ. So if you are running something that is older than let's say Octopi uh, 013, which is from 2016, so 012 or 011, I think someone even said they were still running 0.9, which I don't even know when it was released, I think 2013 or something. So if you are still running something that is as old as that, you might want to consider maybe, you know, getting yourself a second SD card um, just to be on the safe side, flashing that with the current image and then uh, transferring and, and basically uh, yeah, backupping and restoring your Octoprint settings and all that. And uh, yeah, this works as described on the wiki and I hope this will help folks to uh, yeah, maybe upgrade a bit more often. I don't know. <laughs> so the thing is that um, I think for, for very, very old Octopi versions, which rely on a very, very, very old Debian version, uh, I'm not even sure if the official update servers of Debian uh, for, for that specific version are still up. So yeah, I mean, sooner rather than later, you know. All right. Um, another thing that I did, um, which, which is also something that I would classify as a somewhat overdue new bit of functionality is uh, I introduced the central plug in play plug in blacklist because once again there was an issue with a certain version of a certain plugin that caused a lot of people trouble in the field uh, in in so far as that the plugin basically nuked the whole UI so you could not even uninstall it or disable it again via the uh, UI or enter safe mode via the UI and had to clean up a bit via the command line. And um, yeah, this is not the first time that something like that had ha has happened. And uh, so I decided that maybe it might be nice to um, have a way to blacklist certain versions of certain plugins that are known to cause crippling issues with Octoprint. Uh, this might also be in case some kind of very, very, very critical security issue or something like that creeps up. Um, so the way I've I've done this in 136 and how, how I will roll it out is that there is now a, a central blacklist that is in uh, hosted on plugins.octoprint.org, so right with the repository. Um, but usage of this blacklist is opt-in. So uh, I don't want you to think that I will in the future be able to just uh, on a whim decide to uh, um, yeah keep you from certain plugins or something like that, you will always be able to disable that if you do not want the edit, well, basically uh, safety net of this. Um, and uh, on the update to 1.3.6, Octoprint will ask you if you want to enable this mechanism or not, and you will also be just able to um, disable or enable it again when you uh, go into the settings about this. And um, if you say you want to do this, what Octoprint will do is on, on server start, it will fetch, fetch this blacklist with a very small timeout. So um, you should not um, you should not experience any delays or some such uh, if for some reason the server is down or anything like that. And it will also respect the connectivity check, uh, which we introduced in 135. So if uh, I think at least I did it that way, I'm pretty sure I did. Uh, so if Octoprint detects that you do not have a connection to the internet, it will also not fetch the blacklist. But if it can, it will. And uh, check if you have any of the plugins listed therein, in the versions listed therein. And if so, it will not load them. So it will not even discover them, basically. It will just see, oh, this is the plugin XYZ. I'm not going to load that. And um, yeah, that way it won't, uh, it, it will still add a dummy entry uh, so that uh, you will see that you have it installed and you will be able to, dis uh, to disinstall, great English, Gina, uh, you will be able to uninstall it, um, but it will not run uh, at all. So that will hopefully allow to mitigate any kind of issues like the last one that uh, cracked up. And um, yeah, uh, what I also added is a little a command line parameter, parameter sorry, <laughs> that allows you to basically uh, disable that blacklist processing on a per run base. So just like with the save mode, you will be able to just say uh, from the command line, do not uh, do ignore the blacklist. So that should help you. Uh, and just to reiterate this, the one and only goal behind this functionality is to prevent broken plugins from causing real issues in the field. 
uh, there is no censorship or anything like else uh, as an intention here lurking behind anything but yeah i just don't want have people run into issues where they can no longer use the octoprint instance due to some third party plugin uh, yeah, managing to break Octoprint in a way that I so far did not anticipate. As a side note, where every time something like that happens, I also uh, make Octoprint more resilient against this particular thing. And I also try to um, anticipate a lot of ways how you can uh, break things in a way that make uh, that makes uh, serious trouble. But uh, well, I apparently I'm not creative enough yet. <laughs> so uh, sometimes more, st more uh, stuff like that get found. Well, and uh, apart from what I already said there, I, I also did a ton more stuff ever since the first release of um, of, uh, of uh, the first release candidate, sorry, of 135. So the maintenance branch has been busy and um, yeah, there will be a lot of uh, a very long change log again, I fear. <laughs> um, what I also finally managed to get back on is uh, 140. Oh my God, yes, isn't that great? So um, a while ago, uh, I think about two weeks ago or so, uh, Salandora, uh, AKA Mark Anapel, uh, which you might know from a couple of uh, plugins, uh, for example, the file manager plugin, um, filed a pull request against the devil branch. Uh, so against one, what will be 1.4.0 uh, with the uh, new permission system he has been working on over the past year which we also talked a lot about over the course of the last year. And uh, it's finally now on a, in a state where we are now getting it merge ready together. So um, uh, I also now did a more thorough code review and uh, changed a couple of things here and there. And it's, uh, yeah, it's looking really great. Um, and I'll get back to that in a bit, um, because what I'm now going to talk to you about is what are my next steps. And before I do that, I first want to tell you, um, you might have, you might remember that in the past, I, I said that I was, yeah, I was, I was not having as much time to work on development as I, I hoped to, and was more, yeah, stuck with doing maintenance all the time and that it was eating so much time that I did not get around to even working on 1.4.0. And, um, yeah, that was very, very annoying and very frustrating also. And um, you might have not noticed how I looked when I mentioned that. And um, it didn't get any better. I was hoping it was just a temporary thing. It would it would work out itself again. But apparently it's just, yeah, it's 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 something, it's a problem to stay, so to speak. Um, I guess it's uh, caused also by the increase in users and also and, and, and such uh, stuff like that. Uh, and uh, so I figured it was time to try something else. So what I did is I basically overhauled my whole time management approach. Um, uh, what I'm now doing is, uh, yeah, I now have dedicated time boxes throughout the week for, um, yeah, for maintenance. So improvements and bug fixes and all that for uh, development work, uh, AKA what will be 1.4.0. Um, and I also have uh, some dedicated slots for Ticket Riot and support, so answering questions and such, and also a bit of buffer. So basically a quarter of my time is now fully dedicated to maintenance, which is down from what it was before, which felt more like 90%. <laughs> and um, a bit less than half uh, of my time is scheduled exclusively for development work, which is, I think, a more healthy approach to getting this forward. Um, one hour of uh, ticket riot per day, uh, an hour every other day for support and everything else is basically a buffer to compensate for whatever fire might spring up somewhere or the, the overhead of, of infrastructure maintenance, uh, organization taxes, this stuff like that. So uh, what should be clear is I will of course diverge from that in case of any critical problems that might arise. So um, if there is, I don't know, some some really, really serious issue that is causing a huge, of, a huge, a, a ton, a huge ton, a ton of problems for people. Uh, yeah, I will not uh, just go into my development mode and go like, oh, I'm not hearing this, la 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 la. Uh, so don't, don't uh, fret about that. I will, of course, still um, tackle really, really important stuff first. But what um, this 
new approach now basically allows me is to better schedule tasks. So um, I no longer feel uh, feel feel bad when I know that I um, yeah when when something like like some 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 feature request pops up I know okay next week I will have so and so many hours uh, for for development work and I will be able to take a look at it then and when a bug creeps up. Uh, I know, okay, um, I will ha on Monday and on Friday, I will be able to dedicate basically most of the day just to tackle stuff like that. And uh, this really, really helps a lot. Um, and um, yeah, I've been running in this mode now for, I don't know, two weeks or something like that. And um, so far it works to really, really it seems to work really, really well. And uh, I do not have the feeling that anything slips through an, uh, anymore in, in, in the amount it did before, which is uh, a real relief, I can tell you. And I hope that, uh, yeah, it will finally be the solution I was looking for to um, not feel bad all the time anymore about not being able to tackle this and that and that and this. So yeah, please wish me luck. <laughs> I I might report back if, if, uh, how it how it goes in a couple of of months or something like that. So, and with that new approach in place, uh, I also now am finally able to say uh, my next steps are working more on 1.4.0. Finally, you won't imagine how frustrating it was to always have to say, yeah, well, I will probably not be able to get around to do this uh, the past couple of episodes due to all this yeah, maintenance madness. Um, and uh, so the obvious first steps is getting the new permission system finalized, uh, merged and finalized. Um, there's some really, really exciting new stuff in there. So um, what you will be able to do is uh, you no longer have just user rights, admin rights and everything hard coded like, uh, yeah, who, who is allowed to do what. And also you will no longer have, uh, yeah, basically a hard coded guest mode. So you will be able to finally tune uh, which group is allowed to do what. You will also be able to deny everything to guests. And uh, so, so no anonymous people will no uh, anonymous people no longer will be able to do anything, not even see anything. Um, and uh, you will also be able to add custom groups for even finer control, or you will be able to add dedicated permissions to on, a, on an individual per user base. So you really have a lot of uh, fine tuning potential there. And um, the stuff will also uh, the 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 stuff hmm. the, uh, the 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 permission system will also allow to be ex to to extend itself through plugins, of course. So if uh, you have a plugin that uh, offers an API for doing things, for example, a plugin manager, which allows you to list the plugins that are installed, and also installing new uh, plugins, then you will also now be able to fine tune who is allowed to do what. So you could, for example, have a group that is allowed uh, to to disable um, uh, some some problematic plugin, but who is not allowed to install new plugins, something like that. And uh, this also goes for any other kind of plugin that uh, might need to add additional uh, permission modeling. Yeah. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm really happy how this turned out so far. I'm really happy with uh, the work that uh, Salandora did. And I'm excited to get this into one for all. And uh, once we have uh, this uh, merged, uh, the next step will be the com layer. Yeah, there, I said it, finally. I have to admit that I'm really, really scared of tackling this t uh, this topic, um, but it's long overdue. It's a long term, long time coming, and with this new time management model that I've now established, I finally have the time to dedicate uh, to this again. Because the problem with some with stuff like this this permission system or also the com layer is that. Uh, yeah, basically functionality that has such a huge impact and that is so, such a uh, yeah such a huge chunk of stuff. Uh, this is not something that you can just do. I don't know half an hour before uh, end of day uh, quickly after handling tickets and all that the whole day. This is something that you really need to be able to concentrate on fully for a couple of days uh, um, um, uh, sequentially and. Um, yeah, so far I did not find this uh, this this opportunity at all, and now I hope that at least three days a week I will be able to dedicate to that com layer, and that will finally finally get things track on back on track again. I hope. 
and um, yeah, the general goal right right now is for those of you who uh, saw on Patreon the plans, the general plans uh, for for 1.4.0, which I uh, wrote about about uh, about around May, I think. Um, so th there was a lot of sm smaller stuff, and I have not forgotten about that. Um, the thing is that um, it's generally a good idea to first tackle the huge chunks uh, with the with the highest risk, so to speak, to get them out of the way, because those are usually those where stuff goes wrong, and then you know. Hmm, hmm, what to do now and, and can can reschedule things and so this is what i'm doing here and after that i will also tackle whatever fits in still i cannot currently give you a, a time frame when i want to get 1.4.0 out because it's still too early for me um in the whole dedicated development time for it um but once i can i will hopefully uh, get back to you if i don't forget it which i hope i won't um yeah, all in all, all in all, I'm sorry, I'm stumbling over my tongue all all the time today. Um, all in all, I really can't even say how happy I am that I finally <laughs> seem to have found an approach that allows me to, um, yeah, that allows me to get back uh, on 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 new development. I mean, it's important to do constant maintenance and all that, but um, the 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 ratio the ratio between in maintenance and development was completely off the charts and uh, I think now that's way more back on track um, and I fully anticipate that a lot of my time until the next episode will also of course be consumed by the usual madness but uh, now with uh, a, a more strict uh, uh, time uh, boxing in place it will hopefully be in, in a more manageable size uh, so to speak now okay so uh, this now brings me to our Q&A segment, but first of all, I have to drink a bit of water. Sorry, I'm still having a bit of issue with my throat. <clears> throat. And I just noticed that my voice was starting to uh, become a bit rough. Okay, so um, Q&A. Uh, first question. Uh, oh, and before I start, uh, of course, remember, you can use the live chat, uh, those of you who are watching this live, um, and not the recording that I will put on uh, YouTube afterwards. <laughs> um, uh, you can use the live chat to uh, also ask questions now, and I will try to take uh, a look at those. All right. Um, so first question was by Sebastian. I hope I'm uh, pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, beyond testing RC... Uh, release candidates and being a patreon what can we do to support octoprint develop plugins become the maintainer of existing plugins such as firmware updata pull requests for new features or bug fixes and such uh, first of all yes <laughs> to all of that um, in general what really really helps a lot and is uh, and which is something that anyone uh, can do um, is uh, even those who are not developers is uh, uh, yeah please help with support um, because, uh, yeah, we have a mailing list, we have the G plus community and this is, um, yeah, where, where people should go that have something like, have, have issues like, how do I do a custom control for doing blah, or I have this problem where my webcam does not show correctly. Have I gotten my URL wrong or something like that? So typical support questions and, um, Helping people that uh, that have questions like this, they, like these, is something that really, basically, anyone with a bit of experience with Octoprint, uh, with using Octoprint, I should say, um, uh, can help with, and it, it really uh, uh, takes a lot of a lot of work uh, off of my shoulders, and it also has um, has uh, done this, so to speak, in the past, because I have to admit that I really, really, really lowered the amount of support that I actively give unless I notice that something is really broken or uh, some issue, uh, some user is, is, is having a very frustrating experience that no one seems to be able to to um, get to the ground of, then I try to help, of course, where time permits. but. Um, Support can eat up a lot of time, and um, I always feel like I'm doing um, 
I'm doing the wrong thing when I spend a lot of time on support and not on maintenance and bug fixes, so bug fixes and improvements and, and of course development. So if you want to help other Octoprint users uh, to get a good experience, uh, please join the mailing list or the Google Plus community and help out there. So, um, and of course, yeah, report back on the release candidates if you feel comfortable using them. Um, because, yeah, it, I, as, as I mentioned earlier, it helped so much the last time uh, with, with the 135 uh, release, the many uh, feedback um, responses I got. It, it helped so much checking down what if, if there was still something wrong with the release candidate and, and also what and all that. So this helped tremendously. And um, it also was uh, really, really valuable with regards to the stress level just before a release. So um, the more feedback I get, the less I sit there um, basically uh, gnawing on my on my nails after I hit the release button, uh, thinking if uh, well if the next two nights and days will now be spent trying to hunt down some weird issues or if everything will just work out fine. And, and this is an emotional roller coaster that is really not that fun. I, I have to admit. So um, getting a lot of feedback on the RCs apart from helping me iron out bugs also helps a lot with uh, combating that emotional roller coaster that is really exhausting um yeah what else can you help with um issue triage so um i don't know how how many of you lo uh, are following the octoprint bug tracker or, or issue tracker rather because it not only tracks bugs but also feature requests and such um on github um the thing is you can subscribe there to get notified about new issues and such and um you can also just go through it and see what people are reporting and such. And if you see something that looks like a duplicate, yeah, well, comment, just put the comment in there to, to tell me that it looks like a duplicate of issue number or something or somewhat, because then I don't have to look through all the, uh, I think currently we are at 1,200 open issues, which I think 90% are uh, feature requests. Um, and to try to find the duplicate. Uh, we get a lot of duplicates for feature requests, which I just then look at, think, ah, I think I saw that someday or something, and then I can't find the stupid ticket in question that is it is the duplicate of. So helping there helps me again a lot to to save time, spend better maybe on on on, on bug fixing and such. Um, also, if something that someone is requesting, you know, uh, already works, maybe out of the box, maybe with a plug in, but if there is a feature request that say, let's say, would say something like, uh, please add a fi file manager and you know, well, there's the file manager plugin, just comment, there's the file manager plugin, put a link there and then I know, oh, I can close it. Okay. In case of the file manager plugin, I already know that, but you get the drift. And, uh, yeah, this is also something that helps a lot. Um, and yeah, of course, if you can and want to code, uh, writing a plugin or becoming the maintainer of an existing one, for example, those that I'm currently the maintainer of and that I rarely find the time to maintain actually. So the push builder plugin or the, the MQTT plugin or Growl. Yeah, there are a couple of plugins that I rarely find the time anymore. And um, yeah, you could help there. <laughs> you could also, of course, if there are other plugins on the repository listed that you uh, see are not getting a lot of love anymore, you might also be interested in, in helping out there. So not only try helping me out, but the community in general, so to speak. Um, and in general, yeah, just feel free to look at what you can do on Octoprint directly as well, of course. So uh, PR, uh, PRs, pull requests for fixes or uh, small features or such. The only thing is that if you want to do something larger than, let's say, three lines in a file somewhere, um, it would probably be best to get in touch first, so just to avoid things like, you know, I was just about to throw these bits of code out anyhow, which you just modified or, um, yeah, you know, just stuff like that. So a bit of coordination always helps, uh, either through a brainstorming ticket or maybe even better, uh, there is an IRC channel for Octoprint on the Freenode network called uh, hash Octoprint. 
And uh, yeah, during my work, working hours, so from Monday to Friday, during the European daylight hours, basically I'm, I'm uh, on there all the time and reachable. And so are a bunch of, a whole bunch of other Octoprint developers and plugin developers. And also just one or other person who's just happy to help with any questions you might have and, and such. So um, this is always a good place uh, to, to get help. Uh, with with the more developer centric kind of stuff it's not a good place for support uh, mostly because um, it's not searchable we do not have a lockbot or anything like that so support questions still should rather go in places where they can be found with a search engine um, but in general yeah that would would be the things that would really help because they uh, allow me to get more time uh, spent on uh, yeah, on development in of any kind and uh, also it helps keeping everyone happy basically <laughs> all right uh so far i do not see any questions in the live chat i think so let's just continue with the second question again by sebastian um, i would like to see the temperature of my raspberry pi 3 with other temperatures like tool and bed uh, for you, what is the best approach to implement that? Building a plugin based on which mix-in. So the problem is currently there is no way to do that. Um, the the temperature graph on on the on the UI is currently limited to those temperatures that are pushed from the back end that come from the printer. Um, and uh, and sorry, I just got distracted <laughs> by the live chat. And um, And yeah, so far there is no extension point in there. And uh, I'm still, uh, so I'm, I'm planning to change that. And it's also uh, something that was requested uh, with regard uh, in the in the Octoprint uh, Patreon survey that I did uh, last uh, year, uh, end of last year, so roughly a year ago, a bit less than, uh, you, you get my drift. And um, a lot of people requested being able to add, put additional information in this temperature uh, graph. So this is something that I intend to do. The only thing is I'm still a bit undecided how. So I'm not sure yet how best to model that. But the goal is to get it into 1.4.0. This is actually one of the smaller, uh, smaller, uh, yeah, uh, slightly smaller <laughs> uh, um, uh, tasks that I intend to add there. So yeah. Currently, I do not have a good suggestion because I think it would not really work. The thing is, I think you could not even really inject anything via JavaScript or something that you would probably have to replace the whole temperature graph. And this is not really an option here, um, I, I think. Uh, so for now, sorry, uh, currently there is no way to do that, but uh, I'm, I'm hopefully getting there. And um, Now, just to quickly answer a question from the from the live chat by Brian, did I miss the details of what the goals of the com layer refactoring is? No, you did not miss the details, at least not in this episode. I briefly mentioned it in a bunch of episodes uh, before, um, in several actually. And uh, I will also talk again about why this is necessary later, if we get to that question, because I'm also keeping an eye on the clock and um, we only have 20 minutes left. So let's see where we get. Um, <clears throat> so then the next question by, again, by Sebastian in the G code viewer, I like to change the settings, check zoom, show previous layer, uncheck moves and retract. I have to do so uh, each time. Is there a way to save these settings? I see nothing in the admin part. I have good news for you. <laughs> One of the tiny changes I did. Um, in, in the in the maintenance branch already. So what will turn into 136 is um, writing those those um, those checkbox um, states. Yet now I have it uh, to local storage. So it will persist in your browser. You change something, the next time you reload the page, it will already uh, be changed for you. Um, so it will basically behave the same like the the file list filtering and the sorting and all of, all of that stuff, which is also persisted per browser and not uh, as a global setting for everyone. Um, I think since this is more a front end kind of 
many um, manipulation it, it makes more sense to keep it uh, on a per browser base and, and not uh, some some general setting in the admin area um, so far now uh, I implemented it like that yeah but it will be in 136 and uh, I hope this makes a lot of people happy because this is also something that came up repeatedly and wasn't that tricky thankfully to make it's just something that I never found a time to do and my throat is right now killing me sorry I have to drink again <clears throat> yeah the the heating period is also has also started here in Germany because it's cold like what not outside and all the uh, dry air is also not helping a, a lot with stuff like that so um Next question before I start uh, going on a uh, getting sidetracked by, by by talking about my throat, which is not that interesting. Um, by John, have there been any further contacts from printer manufacturers wanting to jump aboard the Octoprint bandwagon the way I Love Objects has since the last time you mentioned the funding hunt? So I had a lot of uh, contacts here and there and also talks and such, but a lot just fizzles up. But Uh, you might have noticed when going on, Oct uh, on octoprint.org um, the past, let's say, half a year or so, uh, Be Very Creative is currently a sponsor. And uh, I'm very happy about that. Um, it also helps a lot. Um, the majority of what keeps the lights on, so to speak, is um, yeah, basically from the user base, though. And to be honest, I think that's actually a good thing. Um, so most most uh, of 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 the um of the support actually comes in via patreon from individual people uh, the only downside uh, is that uh yeah so, so over the past let's say a year or so the the average pledge has been decreasing steadily so more and more people come in but um and also lots of people drop out which is understandable uh, over the course um but the the average pledge decreases and um Yeah, so this is something that I always uh, keep a nervous, somewhat nervous eye on because, of course, it is what allows me to do all this. And if, if this stops functioning, then, yeah, we'll have to see how uh, things continue, if at all. But uh, for now, everything is fine. Um, this stuff is highly, uh, things are highly diversified uh, through the fact that it comes from individuals mostly and not from companies. And uh, so this is, I think, actually a good thing. Um, What I also did is in the past uh, cu the past couple of weeks or months or so is I started to make the Patreon campaign a bit more visible again because uh, I really noticed a couple of fluctu fluctuations here. As I said, I, I completely um, expect and understand that people do not pledge forever. Um, even though a lot of you are now on their way to their two-year <laughs> anniversary and I'm, I'm really, 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 really glad about that and I'm really thankful um, still um, I am trying to promote it a bit more because yeah well basically to combat the, 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 the dropouts which sounds a bit nasty but I don't mean it like that so yeah uh, I do not want to overdo it um, because I yeah I do not want to annoy people <laughs> but um, yeah I just need to do a bit of compensation and need to become a bit active uh, here and there I think so um, yeah in general I uh, of course would also be happy to get some more companies on board but uh, well mostly those endeavors so far have ended in uh, in promises <laughs> sadly but okay I mean that's that's business for you I guess um all right nothing new from the com, uh, from the com layer yeah it is a com layer in a way the the live chat isn't it so nothing new from the com layer live chat um so the next question again from john how would you feel about an open hardware manufacturer shipping kits with octoprint bundled on board well good i guess <laughs> um um And of course, even better if there's also some, uh, yeah, some bit of so, a bit of support coming from that. Uh, um, there are a, a bunch of, of uh, 
questions I've gotten in the past about stuff like that, but so far nothing has come from this, or, or at least not much. I mean, there's this one kit that I also have published on Octoprint.org that we, uh, that I, um, me and Pi3G um, worked on together and uh, which are uh, um, sold through Pollen.de, but apart from that, um, yeah, there's not, not a lot. Um, so this now brings me to the million dollar question or something like that um, about the com layer, <laughs> again by John. Um, I'm going to try to paraphrase this a bit because it was a very long question. Um, basically, um, anything is there anything that can be done to lower latency between 9 cents and Octoprint or not? Um, at Kamikaze, we are seeing that Octoprint always takes 100 milliseconds between sending two lines. Any ideas whether this is something in the Octoprint com layer or if it's an underlying library that's causing issues there? And what can we do about it other than trying workarounds like increased buffer sizes, lower print speeds, etc. So, um, this is actually, or rather, being able to further analyze stuff like that is something that I uh, that that is the reason for for wanting to completely refactor the com layer. Um, the current one has grown more or less organically over the last five years. Uh, it started out as the com layer from what was then Cura, so it's probably completely unrecognizable. Um, uh, what this started on from the current Cura one, and um, yeah, I mean. I added a lot of stuff in there to uh, work together with firmware quirk, quirks and all that. And um, also what I did was, of course, allowing plugins to hook into it and uh, basically rewriting, rewriting, rewrite, I can't say this word right now, rewriting. There we have it. Uh, what is sent on the line or over the line or received from it. And my suspicion is that somewhere in there, uh, with all this uh, G-code processing and all that, that is happening in there, uh, to both enable plugins to do that and also to uh, work around certain problems with firmwares and all that, um, and also to keep things flexible. Um, that somewhere in there, there is some some uh, some processing overhead that is causing issues. Uh, so this is my current impression. I'm not completely entirely sure. It might be at some completely other, a different point, but this is the current approach, uh, the current um, idea. And uh, what I did a while ago is um, because I also had my suspicions that it might be the Python serial library that I'm using, PySerial, uh, is that I uh, wrote a bunch of benchmark um, uh, um, G-code senders, basically. So nothing fancy, just something that um, was able to stream an, 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 uh, a G-code file to the printer's SD card via a serial connection. And I did this in Python, in Java, and in C. And um, then did measurements with regards to how many lines per second and all the uh, per millisecond, rather, <laughs> and, and all that. And um, uh, first thing that showed me was that I s suddenly saw some some huge delays on the Windows. So as a side note, if you are running Octoprint on Windows, I know this does not, um, this is not the case here for this particular question, but this is more of a general uh, uh, advice for anyone running it under uh, Windows and driving their printer with it. Uh, you might want to take a look at your FTDI driver settings because uh, by default they, f they ship with a 60 millisecond uh, delay in sending stuff. And uh, this causes serious issues, um, noticeable, uh, not not necessarily visible as in you look at the printer and you see it stutter. But uh, if you do measurements, you see there is delay. There are delays in there um, where, uh, yeah, some lines are simply not not transferred. You are you send them off from your Python code and continue on. But uh, the driver just says, oh, no, 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 I'm just keeping this here for a bit more. And um, yeah, reducing this delay down to zero really uh, um, removed this this weird delay that I was seeing there. Um, but the other thing that I saw with those three um, uh, different programming languages, language-based uh, tools, was that there was not that big of a bit big of a difference between PySerial, Java, and C performance. So of course there was a bit of overhead on on, on PySerial. Java and C was pretty much indistinguishable from, from each other, but it was certainly not something where I would have said, oh, PySeria has a problem. 
might still be that the way that I use it in this benchmark versus um, the way that I use it, in, use it in Octoprint might be the problem here. Uh, this is also something that I need to take a look at. But um, in general, um, yeah, um, it's it's really tricky to to diagnose issues like this with the com layer as it is, because you do not do not only have the com layer, you also have the whole system attached to it, and uh, the server, and the SOC.js server, and the, the REST API, and the business logic in between, and uh, then somebody maybe is also streaming a webcam, and everything just yeah, it's it's just a, 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 a too complex system to to easily narrow down issues like that. So um, this is uh, also something um, which I tried to um, dump down a bit, um, which is uh, something that also might help you here, John. Is um, if you take a look at the current compi uh, com layer. Uh, main pile basically, uh, you would see that it has a main method, so you can run it. Um, it has a basic command line interface that allows you to do the same as the, the aforementioned benchmarking uh, test uh, tools that I wrote. It allows you to simply connect to a printer and upload a file to its SD card. And um, this uh, will then use the com layer as it is, uh, just with all, all the, the, the CRUD attached on top of it. Um, I call it CRUD, but it's basically the, the, the whole functionality <laughs> other than dumply sending stuff to uh, to a printer that we're talking about here. And um, it would be interesting that if you use that to stream a file to the SD card, if this is possible, I'm not entirely sure if your firmware allows this uh, in the case of Kamikaze, but it might also be interesting to just stream a, a, a file in dry run mode. You might have to modify things a tiny bit for that, but it should not be uh, uh, that huge of a problem, I hope. And it would be interesting if you also see the delays in that case. I do not know how you measured them, but um, yeah, it would certainly be interesting if you also, if, if with the same measurement measurement method, you would also see the same problems there. Um, and I think that tool also logs some statistics at the end of the streaming process, and that should hopefully help there. I haven't admittedly tested it in a while uh, because, um, yeah, too much other th stuff to do. But I think it should still work. And if it doesn't, it should hopefully e be easy to get it to work again. Um, so, and my current idea to generally tackle this is, uh, yeah, I first of all, as I mentioned, the current com layer is I'm, I'm scared of it, to be honest. So it gives me nightmares having to modify things in there. And um, this is because it just simply is doing too much. It is uh, too, too, too interwoven in itself. And um, it gets really, really tricky to isolate certain, certain issues in there and such. So um, this is the reason why I want to do this, this com, com refactoring to uh, rip things apart again, so to make them a bit better manageable and also something that is really, really important for me is to make them swappable. So um, right now you have one com layer that tries to do everything and uh, tries it, it tries to do this, that in one specific way. And um, being able to just uh, rip out the transport mechanism underneath it, so go from PySerial to something that is um, natively uh, implemented or something that runs it its own process, or so, or so to speak, that would be really, really helpful, I think at least, um, to uh, get to the ground of issues like that and also to allow other, uh, more, even more uh, important stuff for the regular user, like supporting other printer types <clears throat> that do not have serial or that do not speak G code or who, that are maybe that are not even printers. Um, so yeah, this is the idea here. And uh, what I would think would make sense is to experiment with stuff like disabling the G-code hooks in general, because as I said, I have the feeling that they might be at fault here. Or at least, and not not as the only reason, because we I, I already also, I also had um, issues reported to me about um, print performance and such before I even introduced those. But um, 
yeah, I, I think they certainly do not make things better and it might might help to to identify other hotspots. Um, also, one thing that I saw in the past is eating a surprising, a surprising number of CPU cycles is the checksumming. So uh, if you're printing, uh, Octoprint basically has to com uh, calculate the checksum for every line that you send over. And this consists of prefixing it with an N plus the current line number, then the command, then an asterisk and the checksum. And the checksum over everything from the line number to the asterisk, which is calculated by an XOR. And um, this, yeah, I mean, this is these are these are mathematical calculations. So these are something that that eat CPU cycles. And we are on a single process setup here. So if you uh, have a, a ton of bad luck and something is currently eating up, um, eating up the oh, not not eating up. Sorry, is currently holding the the global interpreter lock uh, because of some I don't know some request on the front end or some some other bit in the in the whole system. Then no checksum calculation can take place. And um, we are not talking about seconds of delays here, but it might in the end just add up if, if this happens often enough. And um, one thing uh, that I'm also thinking about due to that is, well, maybe down the line really actually fully decoupling the whole communication layer um, from, the, uh, from the main process. Um, the problem is that this basically would nuke most of the current uh, functionality for plugins that have to rewrite um, G code while it's sending or after or, or react to stuff that has been sent. So we could do something like you would still be able to um, react to stuff being queued for sending. But if you rely on being actually able to intervene when, right when it's being sent to the printer, then this would happen in a different process and, and therefore be way, way more difficult to get access to. But um, yeah, it would it would solve a lot of problems, of course, because uh, it would run in its own process uh, on a multi on a multiprocessor machine. That would mean it would be able to run a lot faster than it is able to now. It would no longer have to compete with the web interface and, and everything else that is uh, happening in the whole uh yeah application um and um so that would probably give a huge boost in performance but as things are right now it's pretty much impossible to easily do that it would be easier when i have um separated stuff better than now um and yeah i mean in the long term my goal would really be to get uh as close to native pi series speeds as possible i will unless I start with multi-platform native C code based serial stuff, I won't be able to get faster than by serial itself, but at least getting closer to that would be nice, I think. And um, yeah, of course there will always be an upper limit to how fast you can stream stuff to the printer, not only through Pi serial, but of course also to the whole serial line itself in general, depends on what you are looking at. But uh, yeah, I'm just saying this for the record so that people don't expect me suddenly to push, I don't know, 20 gigabit per second over the serial line. So, <laughs> okay. And I think we'll wrap things up here now because I've already been talking to you for over an hour now <laughs> and I do not want to uh, keep you from other plans you might have this evening too long. So the next question that I had prepared, which by the way was the last one from our question sheet, we'll tackle next time. Oh, no, we won't because this is a very fast one. Okay, so um, final question. <laughs> Uh, John, another one, asks, is there a way to suppress or change the error window on the control page so that it doesn't show a big black box with the error showing where the window, uh, where the video window is, if no webcam is connected? Uh, in 135, it should actually tell you how to achieve that. So um, in a nutshell, just unset the webcam stream URL. Um, if this is empty, then no webcam stream will be attempted to embed and no black box will be shown. Um, this is it, basically. No, not, no, no other tricks. <laughs> okay, but now we are done here. Which brings me to 
wrapping things up because I still don't think there are any more questions in the live chat. Nope. Um, so the next one of these uh, Hangouts, uh, I'm still calling this Hangout because it used to be on Google Plus Hangouts, but I think we maybe I should maybe start rewiring myself to broadcast or something like that. Um, anyhow, the next one will be uh, probably just before Christmas. I have to take a look at my schedule, uh, which weekends are free for that, because I uh, will try to do it on a Saturday again. Um, and I also hope that I did not jinx it just now uh, <laughs> and then we'll get sick again or something like that. So please keep your fingers crossed for me. Um, I will also mention this again in the next one, just to be safe, but I will also do it now. Um, for any one of you who is uh, in Germany or planning to go to Germany to attend the Chaos Communication Congress in Leipzig from uh, December 27th until the 13th, I will be there. At least this is the current plan. <laughs> and I uh, already have my tickets and my hotel booked, so this, this stuff is fine already. Um, and should you happen to be there, please feel free if you see me running around there, uh, probably in an Octoprint t-shirt or uh, at least looking uh, somewhat like this, um, to just say hi, because I really love meeting people who use Octoprint in the real world as well. And uh, yeah, just shaking hands and such. So feel free. <laughs> okay. Um, and with that being said, I think that is all for today. Uh, I hope you have a pleasant rest of the weekend if you're watching this live and otherwise I hope it was entertaining in any case. And I will see you in about a month's time, please. <laughs> and uh, until then, all I can, uh, all, all, is, all, that, all that is left to say, I guess, is uh, until then and happy printing. <laughs>